Okay, yay. So uh, uh, for people who are seeing the recorded version, this is the Boston and Indy joint AWS uh, meetup. Um, and we're still letting people in. And we are very, very pleased to have um, uh, Chris giving a talk that I uh, uh, titled uh, Native AWS Hero Gets Weird. So, <laughs> so Chris, take it away. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, I guess uh, one thing I'd like to start with is just so that I kind of understand, uh, you know, the audience and what your experience is. Uh, uh, of course, I can't see you all, but uh, so how many of you are familiar with uh, machine learning and AI? Do you, do you work with it? A few yays. How about uh, Deep Racer? Okay, all right, well, that's, that's good to know. Okay, awesome. So uh, uh, my name is Chris Miller and I have a company called Cloud Brigade out in Santa Cruz, California. And uh, we are 16 years old. Uh, we do consulting around Linux and open source and uh, about 2014 or so we got into AWS and a basic building blocks and about two years ago got into to AI and ML. So we're kind of leaning into the revolution and uh, yeah, as a business owner, it sounds a lot more glamorous than it is. We're, uh, we're a pretty small team here, and, uh, but we have a lot of fun um, geeking out on tech stuff. So um, live in Santa Cruz. I've worked in tech for 25 years. Um, call myself a geek with social skills uh, on the West Coast out here. You know, I got the ocean, so we're doing the paddle boarding and ocean swimming and I got an e-bike most recently, and that's a lot of fun, especially as I've been getting older. And uh, deep racing, at which I got exposed to at the Santa Clara Summit in uh, 2019. And I came in and almost accidentally won the race in the last hour and, of the uh, event and uh, got swooped away and a camera put in my face. And it was all very crazy. And uh, so that was a picture uh, after the event. Uh, so uh, I got uh, recruited into the, the AWS Community Builder uh, program uh, in their early beta. And this is a program that you can apply for. Um, so if you use AWS, AWS technology, you enjoy writing about it, uh, sharing knowledge, helping others, um, I would encourage you to apply. They have a, a application window that, uh, that opens up every six months. I think one just closed about two months ago. but Keep your eye on it. it uh, there's a private Slack channel. It's a great community. I've already collaborated with some people around the globe on fun projects. Um, and that's great. And, you know, I don't work for AWS. Nobody's paying me to say it. I'm just saying one geek to another. Um, it was, it's been a really cool community. And uh, I was uh, just recently selected to be an uh, AWS machine learning hero. And uh, that was how I met Brian. And uh, so yeah, I'm just having a lot of fun. This is just a great time to be working with this technology and a great time to be um, broadening my network and working with other people. And, and yeah, I'm just uh, having the time of my life right now. Um, so uh, about me, I'm kind of a crazy idea guy. This is a, a cardboard boat that we entered into a race a few years ago, uh, which I extremely overbuilt. Um, but apparently it holds 900 pounds because I was asked to do the victory lap with uh, some of our young developers in there. So it's got, it's got 900 pound weight capacity. <laughs> uh, this is, uh, you know, speaking of Futurama, one, one of my uh, favorite uh, shows, I built this vendor costume and over time added servo controlled eyeballs and a uh, MP3 of uh, Bender sayings and stuff, so I could go into a bar and say, bite my shiny metal ass in Bender's voice himself. <laughs> um, this is a, a local uh, hackathon uh, that started in 2011, 20, maybe 2009. We built a, a proof of concept uh, microbrewery, and so it's a Linux controlled, it has a, <clears throat> a LabJack. Uh, which is a really inexpensive data acquisition and control system over USB. I, uh, when, I be, when I was uh, anti-Linux, I did try to write a device driver for FreeBSD, but finally gave up. And I think that was when I 
said, okay, I'm just going to embrace Linux. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, uh, a fun experience with that. Uh, let's see, next slide. And uh, the Poopinator. Uh, so one of my, uh, my first forays into uh, doing uh, computer vision after working with, uh, with DeepRacer was the Deep Lens device. And uh, so I got to talking with the, the product team and, and uh, got my hands on one of these things. And I had uh, gone to the end of my driveway <laughs> at night, taking the garbage cans down as I hated to do, and uh, came back in the house and I kind of got a whiff of poo. And uh, I thought, man, you know, I wonder if we could train this camera to detect dogs, but only when they're pooping. And it turned out I was right. <laughs> so we did this silly project for fun. This is an engineer of ours, Ben, on the left side of the video there, and uh, came in and I said, hey, you know, I want you to train a computer vision model that detects dogs pooping. And away he went and, uh, and started building a model. And... Uh, we uh, found out that a guy in our business community really needed this solution. So we staged it up at his house and I built an Arduino controller to turn on a sprinkler whenever it detected a dog pooping. And uh, AWS caught wind of this and they said, well, we want to hire a, a video production company to make a video about this and promote you using AWS technology and stopping pooping dogs from going on lawns. And, uh, I'm as shocked as you are, um, but I think it was kind of, uh, you know, being onto something, you know, I'm the crazy idea guy and that actually resonates. So I am just going with it. <laughs> oh, so I'm gonna skip the video for now. Uh, so um, what is Deep Racer? It is a toy car. It's a, a four wheel drive truck chassis and uh, Amazon worked out some agreement with a company that makes a lot of these and they removed the RC controls and they put a uh, Intel based computer node on top of it. And uh, it has two servo outputs, one for steering and one for the throttle. And uh, the reason behind this is that, you know, technically I'm a software developer, you know, normally I run the company, but um, uh, I found it intimidating the thought of learning machine learning We have uh, kids that would come in we do a lot of like internships with uh with students from the local colleges and they get these geeky uh you know software developer kids that have taken these classes all this theory and and going on about machine learning and i'm like man that just makes my head hurt you know i'm not i'm not done with math but it's not my favorite thing and uh so it's just always something i kind of held at bay and uh, when I um, got into the summit class, uh, the summit session on Deep Racer, uh, it was a two hour session, it was hands on, and there was just a stub of Python code that I had to edit. And I was a mechanic for 10 years. So a lot of the settings, the, the knobs that you could turn uh, on, the, uh, on the environment had to do with, uh, with the car steering and everything. So I kind of put my mechanic hat, hat on for that. But uh, the reward function is really simple. It's about 20 lines of Python code uh, to start with and uh, made some tweaks to the code and my model worked really well in the virtual world. And they said, hey, go down to the expo floor. There's a real racetrack with cars. Here's a USB drive, just load your model on there. And uh, it was surreal going out there and watching my car go around the track perfectly the first time and not again it couldn't complete a lap after that and it, fastest time of the day just blew my mind uh and and i was bit and i realized you know hey this isn't as intimidating as i thought it was and what i found through my own machine learning journey is just keep showing up you know the terminology is going to start to set in it's going to make sense you know and i'm not all knowing about all the different uh, facets of the different kinds of data science that you can do <clears throat> um but uh, the more i show up the more i learn and i'm actually working on my uh, uh aws machine learning specialty certification i'm going through some additional training and so i hope to get that cert this year so you know i'm kind of a regular guy you know and uh so I, I would say if you, you're at all interested in this, like go for it, just show up and, uh, and you'll start learning. And uh, the, you know, the point of Deep Racer is to, to lower that barrier or to eliminate it for software developers like it, 
like us to uh, to learn machine learning. <clears throat> and Chris, uh, Chris can I can, can I ask you what was your time? Oh, it you, was like ten point two seconds. Okay, that that's really awesome because I played with the deep racer, and I managed to get the lap time down to like twenty two seconds. Yeah, it was crazy. And then by that was the first summit. And by the time they got to Singapore, there were people getting nines and maybe even eights. And yeah. these were like, I mean, the one, the people who won the, uh, the reInvent race, they were all data scientists, you know, and they weren't playing with the console, like the abstracted console in AWS. They're in SageMaker notebooks and they're doing real data science to improve their times, figuring out how to make the car go in the shortest distance possible. So like going straight through turns uh, to the degree that they could, because right. shorter distance means faster lap time. And uh, and it really showed. And so if I hadn't have gone to the first summit in Santa Clara, like I probably wouldn't be here talking about it. So uh, it was cool to be the uh, the first one. Uh, yeah, and, and so you can compete with, uh, with Deep Racer uh, you get 10 free hours in the AWS console when you turn it on and uh, you train models and then you can submit them to virtual races. And if you get a good enough time, they'll send you to reInvent. So, that, and they did for me. Uh, that's like, wow, I'm coming to reInvent. I can't believe it. Okay, so um, this is a slide from uh, <clears throat> Andy uh, Jassy introducing this uh, back in uh, 2018. So it's just a nice slide that kind of shows you what the what the car is about it's i think it's kind of an ugly car you know only because they put the camera on the front of it so it made it very tall and uh you know so it's what it lacks in uh in sex appeal it makes up for in uh in technology and and geekiness um and they recently open sourced this so uh let's see here i'll just play this clip i don't know how well it'll i'll play over zoom but uh this I, was uh, this is me at, at the uh, 2019 summit, and that was my car uh, training itself to drive. And it literally just starts crashing into walls. And then it, uh, through a number of episodes, begins to learn like, hey, I get a reward every time I uh, stay on the track. It's kind of like training a dog to do a trick. You know, if, it, if the dog does a trick you ask it to, you throw the dog a biscuit, it's happy. If the dog doesn't do the trick, you don't give them a biscuit, and the dog's not so happy. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, like I said, the, the environment kind of dumbs down and abstracts uh, the data science so that it's usable, that it's approachable. And so you can do a lot in there. And um, it's based off of reinforcement learning, which is this reward based uh, uh, type of system. And uh, <clears throat> Amazon just continues to invest a lot of money into this environment. You know, there are people on the team that are dedicated to running the races and building the environment. and uh, it's been cool to um, to be part of that, uh, giving feedback and, and whatnot, and uh, being part of the community. So uh, earlier this year, they decided to open source the uh, Deep Racer. And the reason for this is the car is $400. If you get the base model, there's another version with LiDAR and, uh, and dual cameras. Uh, I think it's, it's 600 something. Uh, but you, the car is not usable without a track. You know, I built my own track with the assistance of our local deep racer meetup that I started. And it just took tens of hours and, you know, it's about $500 in duct tape and foam blocks and stuff like this. And it was a pain. Um, and I didn't want to go out and buy one of the vinyl tracks because it's, you know, had a little shinier surface and, um, you know, I thought I could build a better track myself, you know, and uh, so, but in either case, you know, buying all of this stuff is expensive. You have to set it up in a large area, 17 feet by 26 feet is the dimension of the, the 2019 track. So, uh, so Amazon decided that, well, hey, you know, how could the car be used without a track? And that's where Deep Racer Open Source came in is that, um, that you're up. Uh, I think somebody's got a mic that's hot with some uh, some background noise. Thanks. Um, so they, they asked a question like, well, what would people do with the car if it wasn't about racing, if you didn't need a track? So they, uh, they cornered a group of us, about a dozen of us, and went around the room and asked if there were any ideas. And uh, so we started floating 
floating ideas around. And um, I guess I'll take a step back on this, you know, robot operating system is what, uh, what the car is based off of. And so it's a series of uh, simultaneously running uh, nodes, NBC or Python or other languages, and they communicate with each other in near real time using a messaging system. It's kind of like MQTT, you know, one node will subscribe to a topic that, of interest that it needs to see when certain things happen and then it can kick stuff off. And, uh, and uh, yeah, it's a really, really cool system. I had no idea that that was what uh, DeepRacer was using under the hood. Um, but uh, I, I got to learn uh, the Ross operating system as uh, part of, of working on a project for, for Amazon here. And um, so this will give you an idea of like the, the different, the number of nodes that are involved here. Like they have a, a node just for LiDAR. So the LiDAR sensor, you know, spins around and it detects objects. And then when it finds objects, it sends that message to a topic and other nodes can then pull that information in and then take action based off of that. I uh, already covered this, got a little ahead of myself. So that is a, a vinyl deep racer track and barriers that I had set up uh, down, down the hall from our office. Um, unfortunately, that suite is now taken by another business. So I don't even have a place to set the thing up right now. Um, okay, and uh, this, is, uh, this is the stereoscopic vision uh, with the, the LiDAR. And uh, anyway, getting back to the discussion, you know, they went around the, uh, the room and asking us for, for ideas, you know, well, like, uh, what could you build? And well, we could build a terrifying animatronic toy or not. <laughs> uh, this is, uh, this is a project that, uh, that I uh, started working on a while back. It's an animatronic uh, dummy. Uh, this is a real ventriloquism dummy that I got uh, from some kid at the bus stop. <laughs> True story. It was like doing a drug deal. I handed him a bunch of cash. He handed me a briefcase with this uh, dummy and uh, started uh, uh, putting Amazon technology into it. Um, so oh, let's see. So what can you really build? And this is the topic of the discussion is one guy said, I want to build a better mousetrap. And so he built a robotic cat to go chase around a mechanical mouse with the use case of, hey, we could uh, use AI to uh, to deal with the rat problem, you know, because that's a, that's a big problem. Uh, another guy said, hey, you know, we have the car running around a track doing a race. Uh, what if the car knew how to deal with stoplights? Like we could make these little miniature stoplights and turn them red and green and the car could stop and, and go. And so he built that out. And the uh, uh, Amazon had these three different existing samples uh, that they created, a 3D mapping with the Intel, uh, IntelliSense camera, um, uh, follow the leader example where the car, car would identify a person and follow you around the room. Um, and then there was a non GPS navigation uh, using QR codes. Uh, so the car would drive around, see the QR code and the QR code would instruct it what to do next. So when they uh, came around to me and asked me what I wanted to do, I said, well, why don't we just strap a Nerf blaster on, on top of the car and, and drive around and find objects and assimilate them. And, uh, you know, again, much to my surprise, uh, AWS said, you know, do you think you can get that done in two weeks? Sure, why not? I'll give it a try. Uh, took me closer to four and they pushed back the release of the open source initiative to accommodate this uh, project that they hadn't anticipated would, uh, would use hardware in addition to software. Does anybody have any questions? Maybe I should stop. And before we get uh, into the deep plaster part of it, uh, questions around deep racer. Um, Chris, so the, um, thank you. Uh, one of the things that I had wanted to do and couldn't do because of the whole track thing was I wanted to have a deep racer that would meet, meet a interview candidate at the elevator and then lead them to an interview room. And, uh, I, I'm, I'm wondering if you could do that with the QR code thing or maybe have it, uh, you know, detect the person you know, the receptionist or something and follow the receptionist to the interview room. Yeah, I think um, in terms of uh, identifying a person, you need to have enough images of that person to build a decent model to detect that person, right? So if it's your receptionist, that might be easier because 
it, you may have a num number of pictures of him or her and, and permission to, uh, to build a computer model around that. Um, for a random individual, it might be a little bit more difficult. So you need some way to identify that person. Uh, in terms of navigation, you know, I have not played with the LiDAR uh, part of it. Um, so you could use that kind of like a Roomba to do the, you know, to not run into things. Um, QR codes might be a way to do it. Um, the servos and the steering in the car, uh, you know, getting, I guess if you had the dotted line, you know, on, on the ground, that would make it easier for the car to navigate and to steer correctly. Um, but yeah, I'd have to think about how you would deal with navigation through the office without some kind of system feeding it inputs. Like if you had uh, some kind of an inside GPS system, let's say, um, uh, which is probably, a, maybe that's a more complicated approach than is necessary. I guess with the QR code, if the QR codes were close enough in distance that the camera could always see the next one, then maybe that might be a viable way because the car could then steer towards the QR code and in your camera uh, through OpenCV, you get X and Y coordinates uh, of the object that's detected. And that is what you can use as a basis for changing your steering angle so that you're aligning that object with the center of the screen and thus uh, steering straight. Okay. It's funny, I had all these ideas that involve offices, but which seems kind of moot now. Um, I was also wondering whether you could uh, teach one of these to run around your office, run around the perimeter, and in use, using image recognition, detect a conference room that was open. You know, with this technology, I would uh, I would say that probably anything's possible. You just have to jump in and, and build a model. Uh, and certainly there's a process for, for doing this. I mean, uh, trying to get a bunch of moving pieces uh, to work together um, all at once, uh, that, that's a lot of work, right? And, and my experience with Deep Racer was there were a lot of different things going on, like a lot of different subsystems that needed to be built in the process. So if I was gonna um, try to attempt something like that, then the first thing I would do is build a model that determines if a conference room is in use. Is it that the door is open? Is it that the light's on? Uh, you know, what constitutes a conference room in use? and then start with being able to solve that problem. And once you have that functioning, then to, uh, to start uh, doing the other building blocks, like, okay, I've got to get the car to be able to navigate around the office. How do I do that? Maybe it's the QR code thing. How frequently does it do the rounds, like a security guard? Um, how do you keep the car charged to do this for a long period of time? Because at that point, the battery is going to run out and you could probably borrow from, uh, you know, the Roomba has its own charging station that it can navigate into and, and get charged up and, uh, and so forth. But, you know, it's like any, any technical problem that I'm sure we all work on, it's breaking it down into bite-sized chunks and then uh, putting them in the right order and then executing it. Thank you. All right, anybody else? All right, well, I'm gonna uh, proceed and uh, talk about the Deep Blaster uh, project. So this is a bare bones uh, Deep Racer with a Nerf style blaster. This is actually made by a guy who, who goes by the name Out of Darts. Uh, and so he is part of this Nerf modding community that I didn't even know existed. And he started 3D printing parts to modify Nerf branded uh, blasters that shoot darts in these little yellow foam balls. And it, he was so popular that he moved out of the Bay Area to Washington State. He rented a 4,000 square foot warehouse and he, had, he filled it with 3D printers and he has 20 employees and they cannot print these parts fast enough. And uh, ultimately he came up with his own idea, Jupiter Blaster, that has a couple of flywheels that spin at about 25,000 RPM and is uh, capable of shooting 15 rounds a second of these little foam Nerf balls. So we didn't need that. I had to figure out how to shoot one round at a time using computer logic. And so that was a bit of a challenge. Um, but, uh, you know, my justification for the idea was, is that, uh, okay, you know, I trained a car to race around a track. 
uh, now you've got a lot of people doing this uh, and you know the, the people who are better at it are gonna always be in the top position. How can we make the competitions more complex? So what if the car, in addition to having to get around the track with the fastest lap time, also had to have the highest score in terms of um, uh, blasting foam balls at inanimate objects? Uh, you know, I don't know what that looks like. Is it you know soda pop cans or something like that? Um, and so your your score is a combination of speed and the the total uh, total targets. Um, so that, that was the motivation behind the idea. Uh, so uh, we uh, were able to get our hands on a copy of the LiDAR bracket uh, design file from which we stripped it down and made a, a platform just as a foundation. And then we were able to attach that to the car. Um, there's a makerspace next to my office and I have a, have a uh, subscription there. And so they were really helpful in uh, helping me do this because I haven't really learned how to do all the 3D modeling yet. So I found uh, this model uh, on a thing called, uh, on a website called Thingiverse, where people share open source 3D models. And uh, this is a modified version. Uh, somebody had wanted to put a camera on a turret mounted on top of a toy tank. And uh, so we modified this. Uh, to be able to put the, uh, the Ju Jupiter blaster is the name of the blaster to put it on top there. And uh, that's the Jupiter blaster. And this is, uh, it, this is close to a complete build here. Uh, so the uh, thing sticking out of the back is the magazine that holds 12 or 13 of the foam balls. And uh, I had had it almost assembled here, had to do some other electronics. Um, the motors that spin those flywheels pull like 28 amps of current. If you happen to jam a foam ball in there and it, it, it isn't able to shoot it out uh, and that will wreak havoc on electronics. So um, I can get into the circuitry another time, but uh, yeah, so I had, to, I had to learn some new things about electronics to be able to, to pull this off. Um, so one of the limitations of the Deep Racer platform is that it only has two servo ports. They didn't build the compute node with, in mind for expansion, or I don't think they did. Um, and our uh, uh, Raspberry Pi, on the other hand, has you know a dozen or more I/O ports that can be used to to do run sensor or run servos and read sensors and control solenoids and, and stuff like that. So um, I had tried playing around with the steering servo. I'm like, well, what if I just make the car drive straight and I'll rob the steering servo? controller and I'll use that to aim the deep blaster. And I tried that for a while and I decided, you know, this just isn't a viable direction. I'm, I'm tripping over too many conflicts with the way that the base software was constructed. I really need to break out and, uh, and build my own, my own node. So that required um, getting an Arduino, building a servo controller. Uh, now, deep blaster right now in its current form, it will aim left and right. Um, but in order to properly aim towards the target accurately, um, you need to be able to aim up and down, right? Because the target may be at a further distance. You know, you may not have the luxury of getting up close to it before you uh, blast the foam ball. <clears throat> so I wanted to, I wanted it to be expandable, and I got to thinking for other use cases for Deep Racer in the open source capacity. Um, Think of like Fukushima when uh, when they had the uh, reactor broke open, they had to send a robotic vehicle in there to measure uh, radiation levels because it, it was too much radiation for a human to tolerate. So I thought, well, maybe somebody might want to build a robot off of Deep Blaster that has a sensor arrays, uh, or maybe it controls other devices. Like maybe a rope, maybe the the goal is a robotic arm goes and it picks up things and puts them into a bucket or um, something like that. So, so I really put a lot of effort into the blaster control module, which has its, uh, oh, this is all open source, by the way. So uh, uh, we're github.com slash cloud brigade, and you can find the repos out there. Um, so I thought, you know, this is a classic giving back to the community, right? Building this extra piece of functionality that other people can leverage to do whatever they wanted to do with, uh, with uh, Deep Razor. Um, so one of the challenges there is that you have to get the two computers to talk to each other. 
And the uh, Deep Racer has five total uh, USB ports. Uh, and so with two cameras and a LiDAR and the Intel neural compute stick, which is very useful for doing uh, multiple object detection models, um, it left one port left over. Now, technically I could have used Wi-Fi or I could have used Bluetooth, but I thought, you know, any kind of Wi-Fi and Bluetooth implementation is just inherently unreliable. I'm sure you can all relate to your headset becoming unpaired or, you know, the, the difficulty in getting two things to talk. And then when it breaks, you know, it, it, it's just a pain. So I thought, no, I want a hardwire connection. But it also meant that I had to establish a serial communication protocol um, that was pretty robust. Um, so, uh, so I had to, well, I found open source libraries that I was able to combine together to, uh, to build a more robust control system. So I'll move on to the next one. Again, I'm getting uh, ahead of myself. Full disclosure, I gave this presentation about a month ago um, for the New York uh, Machine Learning Group. And uh, it, it felt very appropriate to reuse this deck. And uh, so I'm uh, kind of jumping around here. <laughs> little bit, so apologies for that. Okay, um, so here's what the electronics looks like uh, for the deep blaster control. Uh, a MOSFET is something that was originally used in high power amplifiers for like electric guitars and music and stuff like that. And it turns out they're very good for controlling high current motors. And uh, uh, yeah, and then we have, I'm not using very many ports on the Arduino. Um, uh, three total, one for the servo, one for each MOSFET. Um, the flywheel spin, and then you use a feeder motor to uh, to load the ammo into those motors. So they sell them in different speeds. And so I got the lowest speed was uh, three rounds per second. And then I just programmed uh, the Arduino to turn it, the motor on just long enough to fairly reliably fire one uh, one foam ball at a time. Okay, so um, my work is based off the follow the leader project. So follow the leader, uh, as I said, it detects a person. And then as the person walks away from the car, uh, the car will follow and it knows how to follow left, follow right, follow straight. Uh, also knows that if the person goes towards the car that it will back up and, and it can also uh, turn. And uh, so it, it does this through a series of nodes that for the most part, I was able to copy uh, existing nodes and then repurpose them for my own, own uses, which uh, not saying it was easy, but it was certainly great to have a starting point, uh, you know, like a proverbial hello world example that already worked and I was able to tweak and tune it from there. Uh, so there is an existing object detection uh, package um, which what I did is, for my demo is I just use the existing uh, object detection. Um, I settled on a bottle, but uh, I think it, there's like 50 different types of uh, objects that it can detect. I, I resisted uh, using the cat model for obvious reasons. Um, the cat wouldn't have been very happy with that. <laughs> Actually, when, this, when the flywheel spun up when I was testing it, my cat just booked because she saw what, what, what I was doing. And uh, she's like, nope, I don't want any part of that. <laughs> so um, yeah, so I used existing object detection model. I forked it because ultimately I would use, I would create my own model that would detect something that wasn't provided by that, some neat object that I would uh, you know put around a, a deep racer track. Um, the targeting controller, um, this is responsible for getting the X and Y of the detected object and then communicating that to the deep blaster control module or node rather. Um, and this was based off the navigation node. And so uh, the deep blaster navigation was tracking the object, feeding those coordinates to the follow the leader model to tell the car, do you drive forward? Do you drive backwards? You know, Do you go left and right and so forth? Um, now to control the uh, deep blaster control module, the Arduino, I could have built that into the targeting module, but again, in the interest of um, allowing maximum expandability and freedom, I decided it was best to have a separate node for this um, that allow people to build things independent of necessarily needing to tie it to object detection. Uh, deep blaster interfaces, uh, 
the, there is an interfaces module that basically establishes these are the messages and communication that I send back, you know, what to expect an integer or uh, a, a float or a text string or, or whatnot. Uh, again, just copied from Amazon, tuned to my own uh, purposes. Uh, it also defines services, and services are a way of, of enabling and disabling, or you know, like like, like to say, arming and disarming the uh, the targeting controller, or, you know, that that kind of thing. And then the uh, the launcher is just really a startup script. It is the thing that is responsible for firing up all of the uh, individual ROS nodes, uh, feeding in or overwriting default parameters, and and so forth. Uh, so, and I got to say, <clears throat> I had known about the project, but I'd never coded in it. And so it was really a blast um, jumping in and learning uh, something new and, uh, and getting something to work like this. So here's a, a workflow of kind of how the nodes talk to each other. And I'll just pause here for a second. I have a typo in the, on the right side here. Uh, the bottom square should be the blaster control module. <clears throat> and you can see the communication thread there. All right, so uh, we're operating on something called an action space. And uh, ultimately my goal with Deep Blaster was to have two cameras. There's the, the existing camera that it, the car is supposed to drive around a track. <clears throat> And then a second one would be mounted on top of the blaster. And the idea here is that, uh, remember I said in, in OpenCV, uh, you get X and, co X and Y coordinates uh, on the object that's detected. And so I wanted the turret to turn until the X and Y got zero on the object, in which point it would know to fire the uh, foam ball at the object. Um, but due to, to time constraints, uh, what I had to do was use uh, what I call a, a static action space. So I use the existing forward facing camera. I determine what the X and Y is of the object. And then I, I point the turret in that direction. Uh, so it's less accurate, of course, because you're kind of pointing it in the general direction with the hopes that you're going to um, be able to make contact with the object. Um, but I was able to use the, uh, the existing action space that was used in the navigation controller uh, with some tweaks, obviously. And uh, this is kind of what that looks like in a, in a spreadsheet when you're kind of mapping these things out. And uh, this is another, another diagram uh, for that. Uh, when, when I worked with the AWS, the Deep Racer team on this, um, what they required was that in addition to writing the code, we had to do all the documentation and um, in, in GitHub. And so if you look at our GitHub repositories, um, that is that structure is borrowed from the AWS uh, 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 follow the leader example. Um, so it was nice. So some of it was just a massive exercise in search and replace. <laughs> but uh, I also had to put a lot of uh, specific things in there. And uh, so, you know, as developers, documentation always comes last. <laughs> and this was uh, one of those cases for sure, but it was a requirement for launch. So, uh, so I had to get it done. All right, so I made some of my points here about why I went with uh, serial communications. And uh, I thought, you know, why reinvent the wheel? Like. I don't need to design my own serial communication protocol. Somebody must have done this before. And I went poking around and I found this uh, robust serial library. And uh, I think it was a kid in France uh, that was competing in a robotic uh, competition. And uh, he created this, uh, this uh, library that was capable of doing up to 255 commands. There was Python and Arduino examples. So, and that's great. I needed to use Python on the deep racer. And uh, so that was super helpful. And, uh, you know, in the spirit of open source, I want to give credit where credit is due. So to Antonin Raffin, um, thank you for building robust serial. Uh, the second thing that I thought was important is that when you're doing object detection, uh, motion matters. And so abrupt jerky motion is going to result in blurred video that's not going to be useful to the camera. And you can see these are two strategies in how you can control a servo. 
and one is fast and jerky and the other one is very slow, but uh, you know, not, not fast enough, right? Um, so there had to be some in between. And I knew like from some experience with a video game project that, you know, you could use uh, math that I don't claim to fully understand to uh, deal with inertia and acceleration and deceleration. And again, not wanting to reinvent the wheel. I found that uh, another smart person, Simon Bluett, uh, created the servo trajectory library. And so it gave us this ability to determine or to define rather how fast do I want to accelerate? How, how fast do I want to decelerate? And although we haven't benefited from this, uh, this in terms of a camera, I haven't put a camera on there yet, but I built with the intent that this was something I was reasonably certain that we would need. And so I included that in the build. And so the uh, blaster control, uh, the blaster controller module code and the Arduino has munged both of these projects together uh, to, uh, to give the basis for doing the servo control. So um, yes, we want to do uh, a, a dual camera design. Um, the deep blaster turret, this is based off a micro servo and I've already broken one and I think I've broken two of them. I just haven't turned it back on to see yet. Um, so we're gonna do a one piece 3D printed model with a full size servo and probably one with metal gears because that, uh, that Jupiter blaster is a lot of weight. Uh, in fact, it makes the car squat and I've got to mess with the suspension to kind of tighten it up. I have communicated with, uh, with Out of Darts, AKA Luke Goodman, and uh, he is making a wearable version, uh, kind of like a wrist mounted uh, version that should be lighter in weight. And so uh, I'm looking forward to potentially collaborating with him and getting a lighter version of this. Um, yeah, dynamic action space we talked about and a hit counter. Like, wouldn't it be great if the computer model, the object detection knows when the object is uh, need, needs to be acquired and when it has been eliminated. <laughs> okay, so I've got some links here. And uh, I think next is my thank you slide. So I'll hang here. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Come on, I know somebody has a question. Do you have a video of it of it shooting? Yeah, uh, if you go to cloudbrigade.com slash deep blaster, uh, I can bring up the video. I just think it's choppy when it goes over Zoom, isn't it? Is, yeah, the give, it a, give, give it a try. Okay. It's, Zoom's gotten better about that, but yeah. All right, there's a way I can optimize for that. Hold on one second, let me stop the share. I think for, for me, it's a little overwhelming to absorb all of the pieces that you put together and to think that you did that in four weeks. I'm a little like, that's a Thank lot. You. <laughs> it was actually, it was, um, it's one of those, like, I can't believe I just agreed to this, you know, kind of thing. Like, uh, but it's, uh, it's kind of hard not to, I just come up with these crazy ideas and then I can, I, I stay up at night. I call it the hamster wheel. Like, my head will just not let go of the idea. And then I'm engineering in my sleep. And then it's like, well, why not? You know, it's obtainable. And then I find out how hard it really is. And, uh, and then you just keep knocking out the problem. So um, unfortunately it meant that I was working uh, even way crazier hours than, than I'm used to. Um, but hey, we pulled it off, you know, it was a success. And so I think there's a lot to be said, you know, motivation wise for, for being able to uh, set a lofty goal and to be able to achieve it. All right, so this is our deep plaster page. Everybody see that okay? Yep. Okay, so um, this is a picture of the track that we made and uh, kind of our early trials. So um, anyway, here's the deep blaster promo. Uh, no, I don't, do you see it full screen or not? Not full screen. Okay. I am going to go over here. Oh, and let me share sound here. Hold on one second. Okay. Oh, and I can optimize for video clip. Great.
All right, can you see it? Yep. Okay, great. Let's... That we're hit with the blaster. Let's build our deep blaster. First, install the parts in the blaster itself. Lastly, the blaster controller. Next, we program the blaster controller. Step three is to build the ROS packages. Step four, load your ammo. It never gets old. <laughs> it sure looks nasty. <laughs> and I love all your steps because each one of those steps is like, oh yeah, and then code the thing. It's like it's like that cartoon of, and then a miracle happens. But it's like step one, a miracle happens. Step two, a miracle happens. Step four, a miracle happens. Yeah, a AWS had uh, had asked uh, us to uh, to do videos for this, and I'm like, well, wait a minute, you know, I, I'm barely able to get this code done on time, you know, and then you want me to write documentation. Okay, I get it. Now I have to be a video producer and and do this stuff, you know. I complained a little bit, but uh, it, you know, it was all worth it in the end. Chris, when you were talking about about the you know the smooth but slow motion, it made me think. I did. I did a, a a virtual camera project, and it was the the one and only time I've used uh, calculus, you know, since uh, since getting out of school, and uh, you know, getting the second derivative of acceleration, which is jerk, you know, to like, you know, okay, I'm going to speed up the move and then slow down the move, so that there's no there's not a high delta of the delta, but you can still move quickly. Um, so. Yeah. Yeah, I had a, um, like I said, we've done a number of internships and uh, and it's not just kids. I mean, I've had people of every age group do internships at our company. And uh, I had a guy working for us, um, you know, became great friends with him. Um, sadly, he passed away a couple of years ago, um, but uh, just brilliant in math and programming, went to MIT and, uh, we talked about doing an asteroids JavaScript game. And so I showed him this, uh, this game that I saw online. And, and so he took it and made its own. We, uh, we were doing a kind of WordPress versus Drupal and, and Joomla kind of thing. And so we used those kind of icons in it. And uh, so when he was writing the game, he was talking to me about exactly this uh, calculus as I forgot it was calculus and talking about the problems and, uh, and he, I have not taken calculus, full disclosure, <laughs> um, but I'm glad that he figured it out. And again, you know, it's like, this is one of the beauties of open source is, you know, there are lots of smart people, smarter than me out there uh, writing code. And, uh, you know, we're able to borrow from those examples and to pull these pieces in and, and build our own technology, you know, and with, without open source, we wouldn't have that. We would not be where we are in tech today. Absolutely. Well, here I got my uh, contact information here. Um, feel free to reach out if you want to have a chat. Um, uh, ping me on LinkedIn. I'd love to connect with you. And uh, this is great. This is, I think, one of the first meetups that I've been a local meetup that uh, has actually uh, pulled in people from around the world. So it's really great to see the community that you built here. Yeah. If I can ask you one more question. Um, and oh, yeah, I've got time. Yay, yay about Go community. Um, one idea that I had wanted to to try, and I'm not. It, it seems like there, uh, Amazon is expanding sort of the bounds of what DeepRacer is allowed to do. But um, when you had that the, the platform where you have the deep, where you have the uh, the blaster, I had the thought that for the DeepRacer leagues, everybody is optimizing for speed. But I was wondering about smoothness. So I had the notion of you put a plastic cup on the top of the deep racer, you fill it to the rim, you know, you put in a measured amount of water. And then at the end of the course, you measure how much water has spilled. And it's especially interesting because you're going to spill on your own car. And so it, you, you would opt, have to optimize for smoothness. 
Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the model or the reward function rather that I chose at the summit was one that incentivized the car to steer less. So it would actually get a penalty. So the reward is a one or a zero, um, mm -hmm. but you, you could feed it like, oh, well, if you, um, if you turn too much, I'm going to reduce your reward to 0.8, you know, and right. it, would figure, it would figure that out. So um, if you don't use that, the steering is very jerky. Um, right now, uh, you aren't able to control, well, in standard deep racer, you're not able to control the throttle uh, through the AI model. Um, that's all done manually. They give you an app and you uh, set the speed, the throttle to a, a certain percentage and you have a stop and a start. Um, but with, uh, I mean, clearly you can do that because uh, the compute node is actually talking to the uh, motor driver, the throttle control. Uh, so certainly it's within uh, the possibility that you can set the car into a self-driving mode that includes controlling the throttle. And I would not be surprised at all if Deep Racer League, uh, that you would actually um, be able to do that in the physical world. Um, everything went virtual last year, so there wasn't you know, an actual race. Uh, in the virtual world, I believe the car does accelerate and decelerate, um, but to date, uh, it hasn't been doing that in the physical world, but I, I think it's just a matter of time. I've actually been out of the deep racer league kind of stuff through COVID, and I'm just now getting back into it. So, uh, you know, as things are loosening up, I'm hoping to get our own meetup back together and, uh, and to start racing. We just built the track at, at our last meeting before everything got shut down. So we, uh, we never actually got to do any racing on the track. So looking forward to doing that soon. Okay. My, my other idea, again, about smoothness was, I'm not sure if, it, if the deep racer could handle the weight, but putting a soda can on the deep racer, and then again, if your car was jiggling, you'd shake up the soda can, and at the end of the race, you had to pop the top next to your head. Well, it can handle a fair amount of weight. I have not actually weighed everything that I put on top of the car. It is making the suspension sag and then I found out that the company that makes the cars has a mod kit where you can replace everything on the car that's plastic with uh, anodized aluminum. And they have uh, upgraded shocks, but I think they're upgraded dampening capability, not, um, not uh, total weight carrying capacity, but you could put little um, shims in, like you pull the spring down and put a shim in and that would uh, increase the downforce. So I think you have a little bit of room to play, but they don't seem to make uh, that I've found adjustable uh, shock absorbers. Hey, Chris, did, um, pretty awesome talk, by the way. Did, uh, Thank you. Did, did you have any issue with the camera um, because of the weight of the, the blaster jarring the camera as you're driving? Uh, did it affect? Like I don't know yet. <laughs> Okay. I, I got everything working with the uh, with the object detection model. So basically, the, the way this works is that um, you build something on top of the platform. So I left all the native capability in there for the car to load a uh, self-driving model and to drive around the track. But it wasn't feasible uh, to, to set up the track to try to do any driving, nor did I even have the time. I mean, to pull it off in a month. It was, was crazy. I was just worked at the end of that. So, uh, but, so I don't know. And that's where, you know, I, I knew like, Hey, the car's sagging. This is going to have clear performance problems going around turns and, and stuff like that. And so, um, I got it to the state that it's in. And so, you know, eventually there'll be a, a, a next phase or, you know, the community can jump in and make contributions and take it from the place where I left off. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think anytime you add weight, um, that, that's going to be a problem. I mean, look at auto racing, right? It's all about like, where can I trim weight out from it? How is that going to change the center of gravity and everything? So I think it's obvious. I'm glad you brought it up, but I think it's an obvious thing that it's going to impact in some way. Um, I don't know that, uh, I haven't dug into the code in terms of, uh, when the car is driving, 
the height of the camera, how much is that going to impact it? Is, is most of what it's doing a left and right, you know, in, in terms of just steering the car or is, is part of the code looking at uh, distance, right? Because if you push the front of the car down, then it's going to make it look like things are closer. I'm just not sure um, how it would impact that. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it very well could. Okay. So Chris got another crazy idea. Um, you know, this one might take you as much as three days to do. So um, uh, I'm thinking an outdoor squirrel chaser. So, because um, squirrels just decimated my pear trees and, you know, like, you know, it's war and, I, and I'm obviously losing. So replace the wheels with bigger wheels to be um, able to go outside, um, add, an, uh, add battery, which is, you know, a weight trade-off, um, but, you know, a recognition, a model that would recognize squirrels and just chase them. Well, to your point, think about it this way. If you had an industrial use case for this in which a toy, uh, you know, four-wheel drive truck was not the ideal physical platform, uh, there's no reason why you couldn't take the uh, compute node or to load the code on something similar, right? Because they've open sourced, uh, I think, most of it. Um, and then put it on a more industrial framework, right? Because you have steering control and you have a throttle control. Uh, so that those are known quantities. And, uh, you know, this is all just using off the shelf RC control stuff. So you could definitely build something bigger. In fact, um, someone built a go-kart using the deep racer technology and they've made a self-driving gasoline powered go-kart. Yeah, they're in the uh, in the deep racer community, so I don't know if they took the compute node off of their um, off of their deep racer if they used Raspberry Pi or something, um, but that that's certainly uh, possible. 